Okay, is everyone ready to go? Christy, Da, Kasha, James? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, all right, fantastic. Let's go ahead and begin. Um, let me welcome everybody to the third of our occasional um, online uh, symposia of um, climate sensitivity and cloud feedback. Um, Uh, just a few notes. There are going to be three AGU style talks. Um, everybody should be muted, uh, but if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat at any time, or um, you can raise your hand. There's a button, a raise hand button on the participants list. Uh, and if you do that, then after the presentation is over, we can unmute you and you can ask the question um, in, in person or via voice. And then we'll have a short five minute or 10 minute, depending on how long people stick around, Q&A at the end uh, after the last talk, if people have sort of general questions or any general discussion. Um, to the speakers, uh, Christy will do the introduction. I think he will give you a, a few minutes left warning. So um, let's try to keep the talks to, you know, 12-ish, 14-ish minutes. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over uh, to Christy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. So yes, our speakers today are Da Young, Kasia Tokarska, and James Annan. Uh, and Da Young is going to be our first speaker. He's an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, and a faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, I will give you a 10 minute warning. So with that, take it away. Thanks. Can we see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, well, uh, to move too fast. Good morning, everyone. I'm Da from UC Davis and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And uh, today I'm here to tell you a story. And uh, this story is about water vapor and climate. Uh, most previous uh, studies or stories emphasize three effects of water vapor. It's greenhouse effect, the latent heat release, and cloud source platform relationship. But today, um, this story will feature the buoyancy effect of water vapor or the lightness of water vapor. What is it? Water vapor molecule has the molar mass of 18, which is lighter than that of dry air. And we have two parcels, one is completely dry, and the other uh, with moisture in it. The humid parcel will be lighter, even with the same temperature, pressure, and volume, simply because of the low molar mass. And that is the lightness of water vapor, or buoyancy effect of water vapor. And today, we're going to hypothesize this effect will make colder rise in the tropics and can help stabilize Earth's climate. Let's see how it works. Uh, we'll start this story um, by looking at NASA observations. Here I'm showing you temperature in red and virtual temperature in black. Temperature and virtual temperature uh, in pressure coordinate and the x-axis is column, uh, column relative humidity uh, percentile. So on the left, it is the driest column in the deep tropics. On the right, it's the most humid column in the deep tropics. And we'll see that virtual temperature is horizontally uniform, but temperature has a tilt. What does this temperature tilt mean? You would use the temperature of the driest column minus that of the most humid column. We'll find it's about two Kelvin. Yes, uh, that tilt means cold air rises in the tropical free troposphere. But meanwhile, uh, we do the same thing. Uh, we find that uh, temp uh, virtual temperature is pretty horizontally uniform. And uh, why is that? Uh, let's uh, take a look at the physics. We propose it's vapor buoyancy makes colder rise. Okay. And here I'm drawing a cartoon of the large scale circulation in the tropics. So this is the moist subsiding branch and this is the dry uh, subsiding branch. And black here again represents buoyancy density or virtual temperature and red here represents temperature. And in Earth's atmosphere, buoyancy has two components. One is thermal buoyancy, the other is vapor buoyancy. And because of the low coriolis parameter in the deep tropics, buoyancy is horizontally uniform uh, due to the efficient uh, gravity wave dynamics and the Halley circulation. 
when we move um, from moist columns to the dry columns, uh, vapor buoyancy is reducing. To maintain the uniform buoyancy, thermal buoyancy has to go up. That is why there is a temperature tilt, okay? And this effect really makes a dry regions warmer than it otherwise would be uh, in the absence of vapor buoyancy. So if we don't have vapor buoyancy in the atmosphere, then buoyancy is simply a function of temperature, uh, which then will be a horizontally uniform or this flat line, the uh, light red flat line here. And if you compare the two temperatures, you will find that with vapor buoyancy, the dry column will be substantially warmer. And this higher temperature can increase our going long wave radiation, which is a uh, radiative effect. And in climate warming, there will be more water vapor in the atmosphere. So we expect vapor buoyancy becomes increasingly important that will amplify this radiative effect, which then uh, stabilize Earth's climate. That is a clear sky negative climate feedback. And that is something we're going to test today. Before we show you um, cloud resolving simulations uh, to test the theory, um, I want to emphasize that this feedback loop is distinct from the traditional lapse rate feedback uh, because uh, this feedback carries about horizontal temperature gradient uh, versus vertical in the lapse rate feedback. And also, yeah, uh, temperature uh, change or amplification is really in the lower troposphere. What I'm going to talk about today um, are, is based two recent papers, one in Journal of Climate features a simple model, the other is in size and immenses a future in cloud resolving simulations, which we're going to focus today. Um, there are two key, key ingredients in this hypothesis or mechanism. One is the weak horizontal buoyancy gradient in, in the free troposphere, and the other is persistent moisture contrast. We feel that we can use a relatively simple setup to test the hypothesis that is convective self aggregation and here I show you two cloud resolving simulations for convective self-aggregation. This is a time, this is X, and what I'm plotting here is precipitable water, okay? And this is a control simulation. We see that uh, um, dry patch and uh, moist patches self-emerge and persist over a thousand days. And we also create a mechanism denial experiment in which we remove vapor buoyancy in the dy dynamical equation in the model. And the difference between the two simulations really highlights the role of vapor buoyancy. Okay. Um, now let's see what happens once we remove the vapor buoyancy and if self aggregation reproduces some features of the observation. Here again is the temperature, virtual temperature plot. Uh, this is observation we see. And this is the control simulation. The control simulation roughly re reproduces what we see in the observation flat virtual temperature and tilted temperature. And now we look at the mechanism denial experiment, we find that the temperature in red is horizontally uniform. This really supports our hypothesis that vapor buoyancy makes cold air rise. Um, but we can do better than that. Let's be more quantitative. Uh, based on this equation, buoyancy equals thermal buoyancy plus vapor buoyancy, and assume there is uh, no horizontal buoyancy gradient in the tropics, we can derive a horizontal temperature uh, difference due to vapor buoyancy, which is x-axis. And y-axis, we can directly diagnose that temperature difference from either observation or from the models. And we plot them together, and the uh, solid line is the one-to-one -one line. We find observations and control simulations, they all stay close to this one-to-one -to -one line. Uh, uh, this really suggests that our theory matches observations and numerical models very well. And on the other hand, uh, I want to point out these open circles are for uh, mechanism denial experiments, which we don't expect to see a horizontal temperature difference right here, so they're flat. And I also want to point out the orange color here represents a warmer simulation, 310 Kelvin simulation. And as expected, the horizontal temperature difference increases due to more water vapor in the atmosphere. Now let's see what does that mean for climate and radiation budget. Um, this is time, and this is uh, our going long wave radiation in the 300K and 310K simulations. And one is control, the other is mechanism denial experiment. And we see that the control simulation has higher OLR throughout the entire simulation period, and the gap between the two simulations increases uh, with surface temperature. That is a sign the radiative effect increases with surface warming. And we can quantify that. We run a series of numerical simulations from very cold climate to very warm climate. 
and we can diagnose the radiative effect in the reference climate is about two watts per meter square. And that's very similar to doubling CO2, not quite there, but the same order of magnitude. And we also find this increases with surface warming. And we can use that information to diagnose a feedback parameter, which is down here. And in reference climate, it's about 0.2 watts per meter square per Kelvin. That is similar to cloud feedback or surface albedo feedbacks. And that also increases with surface warming. That says in warm climates, this feedback could become of leading order importance. Okay, today we've introduced um, a um, clear sky feedback that due to horizontal temperature difference um, um, uh, due to vapor buoyancy. Um, and that feedback has a um, pretty significant magnitude. But do GCMs properly represent vapor buoyancy and this feedback? Uh, we're investigating that. Uh, here is a tier slide. On the right, that's a figure we're familiar with. Uh, this delta T versus delta T plot. If with vapor buoyancy, we expect all data points align close to this one-to-one -one line. If no vapor buoyancy, we expect to see a uh, horizontal line. And on the left, I show a uh, diagnosis from CMIP models. I only show two GCM uh, results. And model A, um, all data stay close to this one-to-one -one line, but model B is rather flat. When we compare the two figures uh, one of the hypotheses is that model B doesn't represent uh, vapor buoyancy properly. And there are other hypotheses that we're um, exploring. And I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so if you have questions, either type them. Uh, that was good timing, by the way. If you have questions, either type them in the chat or use the raise hand function. Um, and put um, in the participants window, and I will unmute you, and you can um, ask ask your question. Hey, Eric the Weaver. Eric the Weaver asks, any thought on the effect on convective aggregation? Ah. Um, sure. So. In 2018, I published uh, two papers. One on what determines the spatial scale of aggregation. Um, uh, which is uh, um, referenced here. And we find that um, the vapor buoyancy can uh, increase the spatial scale of uh, self aggregation. And another paper in James, it discusses that um, what maintains or what uh, favors the development of self aggregation. And we find that uh, vapor buoyancy uh, favors the development of uh, aggregation. In other words, if vapor is, if water vapor is even lighter, self aggregation would be easier to uh, emerge. Hey, uh, Paolo Cepi asks, what are the contributions of temperature and water vapor anomalies to this feedback? Excellent. Um, so we, in this uh, wide range of climate uh, simulations, we diagnose uh, both the um, clear sky water vapor and clear sky temperature contributions. And in a given climate, uh, they both contribute and pretty significantly but uh, only temperature has this increasing trend suggesting a robust feedback. And if you look at the water vapor contribution, it goes up and down. In other words, water vapor doesn't contribute a significant uh, or robust feedback mechanism here. Okay. Um, next question is from Robert Pincus. Uh, the physics seems so basic. What would a GCM miss about this mechanism? Um, so one, um, one possibility if a model misses this uh, mechanism would be a uh, misrepresentation of a virtual temperature uh, in the equation of state. That is one possibility, but there are other possibilities. Hey, Christine, this is Andy Nesser. Maybe I'll take convener's privilege and ask a question. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, I've spent a lot of people have spent a lot of time decomposing the feedbacks in climate models, and to a good yeah. approximation, we can close the budget in the models. We can decompose them into the feedbacks. We sum that up. We get the total feedback parameter out of the model. Um, and and so the question is, if this feedback exists in any models, um, either it's very small in the model or it's being aliased into another feedback. 
you know, it's being included, you know, and how we do the decomposition. Do you have any thoughts about that? About, you know, is, is there a way to, to de how does this fit in with what people have already done on decomposing right. feedbacks from models? Right. Uh, so when we wrote these two papers, we do think that this feedback is included in every climate model. But after we had this uh, very preliminary results for two SMIT models, we realized that for some model, um, they probably represent vapor buoyancy pretty accurately, uh, as it's supposed to be. And for some models, uh, we see a sign that it may miss vapor buoyancy or some, um, um, uh, some other factors uh, flatten this, um, uh, this curve. So that suggests that some models may not properly represent this feedback. But go back to your uh, deeper question, like people have been closing the feedback budget. Uh, what, uh, so what is this included in previous analysis? Uh, I think it's included in the diagnosis of lab trade feedback, which, um, which is attributed to any warming that is not uniform. Um, that is our uh, current thoughts. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize conceptually the two kinds of feedbacks are quite uh, different. If you look at um, this feedback versus the traditional tropical lab trade feedback, one emphasizes how the vertical temperature gradient changes and our emphasize of horizontal temperature gradient changes. And lapse rate feedback emphasizes the amplification of the upper troposphere, but ours is really a lower troposphere signal. I need the dry patch. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks, that was a good point. Uh, okay, one more question from Eric. Uh, I wonder if the new COSMIC2 data would be useful for this research. Uh, approximately 5,000 soundings per day over the tropics, sensitive to temperature and also water vapor up to maybe 300 millibars. Yeah, uh, that would be very useful and uh, we should uh, uh, take a look at that. Thanks for the suggestion. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question from Daniel Cole. Uh, what do you expect the spatial pattern of this feedback to be? Ah, that's great. Um, Let's see, there are two key ingredients in this feedback, aside from vapor buoyancy, and one is um, a horizontal uniform buoyancy gradient, or horizontal uniform buoyancy distribution, and the other is uh, a lot of moisture with distinguishable dry moist patches. To satisfy the two criteria, um, we think it'll be in the tropics. Um, because we have Hadley circulations, we have water, water circulations, they both create um, moist and dry regions and the tropics, uh, the Corollus parameter is really low uh, that can um, provide a weak buoyancy gradient atmosphere. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank you. Well, if anybody has any more questions, uh, type them uh, in the chat and uh, we might get to them at the end when we're going to have a short Q&A for whoever wants to hang uh, around after the three talks. So now we're going to move to our next speaker. Uh, Kasia, can you share your screen? Okay. So our next speaker is uh, Kasia Tokarska from uh, ETH Zurich. Um, I'll give you a 10 minute warning. Take it away. Uh, thanks so much for this invitation. I'm going to talk about uh, the observational and emergent constraints. We've been doing um, work with regards to CMIC 5 and CMIC 6 models. Um, so just briefly to clarify, uh, we're using two key metrics and one of them is the TCR or the transient climate response, uh, which is the measure of the strength of the rapidity of climate change, which is kind of instantaneous and it's defined in 1% CO2 only simulations at the time of CO2 doubling. Uh, but uh, the other metric is the so-called equilibrium climate sensitivity or ECS. Uh, however, it's not uh, measured at a true equilibrium as there was a previous talk by Maria Regenstein. So here for simplicity, we refer to it to ECS as the model benchmarking metric. Um, however, I'd like you to, to bring the attention to the fact that there's not a linear kind of easy translation between the two metrics because TCR and ECS are non-linearly related uh, as the ocean 
heat uptake comes into play in determining ultimately ETS. And also there's the pattern effects from the warming patterns that might be changing with climate change. Uh, therefore, it's much easier to observationally constrain TCI, which is transient metric as our observed historical warming record is also transient. And we're not right now in, at equilibrium. So as you are probably familiar with the set of CMIC-6 models here, there's 40 of them ordered according to their ECS value, which we only use here for model benchmarking. And the fifth assessment IPCC likely range is one and a half to four, four and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, the, uh, in this set of models, 13 of them have ECS values higher than 4.5. And Kanye SM here is right here at the top, for example. It's, I think it's my favorite model because it's the one with the Twitter account. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing why those models have high ECS values, there's this excellent paper by Mark Zelinka and colleagues explaining the causes of the climate sensitivity and why is it higher. And I think there's also a recorded talk from the seminar series, so check out the website. In this talk here, we're going to focus on the projections of warming of those models. So are the projections of CMIC-6 models likely? And what are the implications of those results? And also what are the different lines of evidence suggesting the conclusion. So these are the two main questions I'm going to answer in today's talk. Um, so we're using the emergent constraint approach where you can have one variable that can be directly observed and if it's correlated to another variable, which is a future variable or something that you cannot observe, you can potentially use the emergent constraint approach. And this is nicely discussed in Alex Hall and colleagues' perspective on nature climate change, which I also encourage you to check out if you're interested in this method. Uh, what's really important is that there needs to be a strong uh, statistical relationship between the two quantities. And also, you don't want this correlation to be spurious or random. You want uh, to have a verified mechanism and a reason why those two quantities should be correlated. And you can also use out-of-sample testing uh, to see whether your correlation uh, holds outside of your original sample. So that's why CMIX 5 and CMIX 6 models provide us nice two sets of samples to test whether the emergent constraint from CMIC-5 hold for CMIC-6. And if, uh, if the constraint actually seems to be matching those criteria, you could potentially uh, reduce uncertainty in the future climate projections. Um, so that's why uh, we chose specifically the post-1980s period. We chose 1981 to 2014 and 2017. Uh, and we're using the observed warming trend for that period. Uh, the reason for it is that it's sufficiently long period the internal variability influence is quite small. Also, uh, it happens to be that both Pacific and Atlantic uh, modes of variability, which is this low frequency, long term variability, are actually compensating each other in this period. And the changes in other forcings are slow because TCR is mostly uh, is determined due to CO2 alone, so it's only greenhouse gas only metric. And as you can see here, um, in the post uh, 1980s period, Aerosols are still present, but the trend in the aerosol forcing is almost zero. So it's the, the response is dominated by greenhouse gases, and also this signal is much stronger than it was before. That's why using this uh, post 1980s period uh, makes more sense in uh, constraining future warming, which is also mostly due to greenhouse gases or TCR, which is also CO2 only kind of driven metric. Um, and uh, as you can see here, here's a set of CMIC-6 models available at the time, which are plotted here, and there's a correlation uh, between them. So the projected future warming or TCR also are correlated with the simulated warming trend for both decades. And therefore, our goal is to provide some kind of uh, observational emergent constraint on the first TCR and also then future warming in SSP scenarios. Uh, so we're using uh, a mean of two observational data sets, Cohen and Wei and Gistemp. The reason why we chose those two is that they are nearly spatially complete and they're also quite different from each other. So both of them use different data sources for both SSPs and the also la land surface warming. There are a lot more other data sets, but they're kind of like not fully independent because some of them use the same SSP products or so on. So even though they're quite different, it really makes very little difference to our results, um, what kind of observational data set we use for this method. And our constraint that I'm going to show on the next slide does account for uncertainty from internal variability. Also the blending effects, so you have um, calculating global temperature trends uh, between the ocean, the SSPs and the land uh, surface temperature, and also structural uncertainty, uh, which we calculated from the 100 ensemble Hutchcote 4 data set. Uh, so this is our uh, emergent constraint on uh, TCR based on this method. So you can see the blue rectangle is the constraint. Uh, range and the 
median constraint uh, PCR value is to one and uh, 1.6 degrees Celsius. And if you would uh, to take the median from the whole sample of CIMIC-6 models, it's going to be 1.95. So our constraint results show uh, that the, both the median and the upper end range are lower. If you're interested in knowing what kind of models are here, uh, they're actually labeled by the first letter or two, and they are described fully in our paper. Uh, and they are colored by, by the value of their ECX. So all the models that are outside of the four and a half degree range, which is outside of the IPCC likely range, are in this dark red color. And these are the models here. So you can see that they are outside of the observational constraint show that are shown by the gray rectangle. And they are also not part of the constraint range here. So that's why uh, we could say that most of the high ECS models overestimate the observed warming. And as a result, the, their higher future warming projections are less likely. Um, so we did it both for uh, CMIC-6 models, for CMIC-5 models alone, and for the joint sample of CMIC-6 and CMIC-5 models. And the results are kind of uh, consistent, uh, regardless of what set of models you use. Uh, so for example, uh, the unconstrained raw range is in gray, and then the constrained range is in blue. As you can see in all cases, and especially in the CMIC-6, it's mostly visible. The median value is brought uh, lower, and also the upper end of the 5 to 95 percent range is also lower. Uh, so, as a result, if you take the multimodal mean from CMIC 6 global mean warming, it's going to be biased high, and therefore uh, those projections are less likely. They are not consistent with observations uh, right now, and they are less likely in the future. Uh, there's also several other studies that are recently in discussion or just published that arrived to very similar conclusions using slightly different approaches. Um, so this kind of would also suggest that like using the raw CMIC-6 global mean temperature is not a good idea and you should use some kind of observational or emergent, emergent constraint approach um, if you want, you're interested in the whole spread of the CMIC-6 model. Uh, so the next uh, part we can look into, so far all the results were based on global mean temperature trends. Um, but uh, how does the regional warming contribution matter to it? As I mentioned before, we want to make sure that this emergent constraint does not arise due to random or spurious correlation. There needs to be a mechanism behind it. So one way to test it is to look at the multimodal mean fingerprint of the spatial variation. So this is kind of similar to detection and attribution techniques. And what we did here, we removed the global mean trend from each of them. For, for each model spatial map of warming, we removed the global mean trend of, for that model. And then we took the mean of all those kind of uh, the trended maps. Uh, and therefore, this is kind of this multi-model fingerprint of our change. Next step was we projected the model warming pattern with the global mean removed onto this uh, multi-model mean fingerprint shown above. And we use this kind of covariance uh, to correlate it with the TCR value. So the, the reason, the, basically the meaning of those figures is there's no global mean signal at all in this analysis. And as you can see here, it's, there's still quite a strong correlation. It's a little weaker than it was for the global mean case, but there is a correlation. And you can see regionally most, um, the regions that we would expect contributing to this correlation are, is like the polar amplification region. And we can also see the land sea contrast. Uh, of course, the um, observational um, constraint here is, has much, uh, much higher, uh, much larger rectangle, much la larger spread because internal variability on a regional scale is larger than on a global mean scale, but the same kind of uh, conclusions can be drawn here because the high ECS models, for example, here from CMIC-6 uh, shown here, are outside of this observational uh, constraint as well. And therefore, also we can see that the high ECS models simulate too much of the regional warming patterns that is not supported by the observations, even if the global mean response is removed from those models. So this is just an independent and another line of evidence supporting our earlier observational constraint. We would not recommend using only like kind of this type of patterns that don't have global mean signal in it because global mean does provide you valuable information. But this was an alternative way to check uh, the validity of the constraint that the, it's driven by mechanisms and not by the random correlation between the models. Uh, so what are the implications for future projections? So here specifically, we're interested in minutes for now. An agreement target. Thank you. And um, looking at the scenario that was designed to meet the Paris Agreement target, for example, the SSP 1 to 6 uh, ambitious mitigation scenario. So Paris Agreement target is this uh, yellow rectangle here. And this high emission scenario, um, 
you can see for the set of steaming six models, all the high ECS models exceed Paris Agreement target, even in this ambitious mitigation scenario. And of course, all the models exceed uh, the Paris Agreement target in kind of no mitigation, worst case scenario. Um, there is a correlation again, so we can kind of use the same method. We use observational constraint, and then we produce the observationally constrained future warming. And as you can see here, the blue rectangle is within the yellow rectangle. Therefore, uh, the observationally constrained steaming six warming is consistent with the Paris Agreement target by the mid-century. And so just another way to summarize this information, we can look at the mid-century and end of the century warming. And uh, this is raw response from steaming six models and the blue bars are showing constrained response and it's lower and it's for this ambitious mitigation scenario particularly. Uh, we're consistent by the mid-century and we slightly exceeded by the end of the century, but the likely range is still within uh, the Paris Agreement target. Um, so I also would like to, to draw your attention on my last slide to other papers that are using alternative methods, but the results are kind of consistent generally with, uh, within all these previous studies mentioned. So for example, there's um, another approach also developed here at ETH of model performance and weighting, and there's uh, two papers one from the Canadian group and then from the ETH group um, that use this method, which they, it's quite a different method. They develop model weights on the model match with the observations. And also they downweight the models based on its, uh, like if the model response is too similar to other models, they downweight it. So independent models are valued more. And uh, using this completely different method, they also produced constrained uh, future, weighted future warming result, and they are also lower than the raw response of the whole CMIX6 ensemble. So generally across all the different studies I mentioned here that came out uh, mostly this year, uh, conclusions are the same that the raw CMIX6 uh, mean, global mean temperature is biased high, and most of the high CS models overestimate observed warming, so their future productions are less likely. Uh, so you might ask, what should we do then? And uh, there's a suggested approach. So for example, uh, there are time shift approaches suggested earlier. And one thing that many people look, of course, it depends on the question you're asking, but uh, it's, for example, good to compare models for a given level of warming. So at two degrees of warming, you can compare, for example, the regional warming across the models. But if you compare it in a particular given year, you might be getting uh, artificially kind of like large spread of models, but that's uh, not really likely response because it's biased high due to the high warming uh, CMIX-6 models. Uh, so thanks so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks for a great talk. So, okay, same thing. If you have a question, either type it in the chat or uh, use the raise hand function in the participants window and I will unmute you. Uh, Paolo asks, is the pattern effect an issue? We know that the SST pattern caused anomalously negative climate feedback over recent decades. I am not sure exactly, like we didn't really look uh, for the feedbacks exactly, but I would say because we're looking at the transient warming and the near term future warming, like I wouldn't worry as much about the pattern effect as if you're like trying to constrain ECS or like really like end of the century far away warming. So I think um, my argument is always like on the shorter time scales, I think the pattern effect matters less, but uh, I'm not really an expert in that. I guess while we're waiting for the next question, if we're, uh, ah, I think Kyle might've beat me to it. Okay, so Kyle asks, Large ensembles suggest internal variability can have a large impact on the warming rate over 1981 to 2014, with individual ensemble members occasionally showing small warming over this period, even in high ECS models. How do you account for the possibility that warming in nature represented one particular phase of variability with a low warming rate, introducing a common bias in the emergent constraint? This is possibly related to the pattern effect like Paolo mentioned. That was my question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's a question we get a lot. And we actually uh, did a lot of sensitivity tests uh, regarding for it. So uh, we kind of take the, uh, in the end, we decided to like a reverse approach. So we take the multi-model mean from large uh, ensembles or however many members were available at the time. So our points already account for it. And we added 
an estimate of uh, internal variability onto the observations. That's why this gray rectangle was kind of wide because of the internal variability being the largest um, thing, uh, the largest component contributing to its uncertainty. We also estimated internal variability across the large ensembles um, and also in many different ways. So we had several ways of estimating the internal variability for the two periods we considered. And we used the uh, largest, uh, I think I have actually extra slides showing it, but we used the largest uh, possible amount. And we, uh, we also did a sensitivity test where we used a large ensemble of Kanye SM5 uh, instead of just uh, like, what, yeah, and uh, it didn't really affect our results. So basically I would say interoperability is important, but I think we consider a long enough period that it doesn't really affect it. And we also did account for it in our observational uncertainty in this like gray rectangle. Okay. Um... Question from Kevin Bowman. Can you elaborate on the correlation and signal to noise ratio in the emergent constraint and how they propagate into the ECS? So are you suppose that's all signal to noise? That's related uh, question. So, so yeah, we're looking at the, the we're trying to uh, constrain the force response. That's why we try to minimize the role of internal variability by taking long enough period and then adding internal variability onto the observational estimates. So to kind of have this uncertainty added onto the observations. And that's why our blue rectangle, the constraint was like kind of wide because of that. Uh, and we don't constrain ECS particularly. We only constrain TCR because it's a transient metric. Uh, if you would like to constrain ECS, there's uh, Thorsten Moritzen and Diego had a paper in Nature Climate Change last year indicating how can you account for this pattern effect and additional nonlinear feedbacks to constrain ECS, but uh, we didn't uh, do it in this paper. I guess the one consideration there is we have to hope that the large ensembles are able to reproduce uh, natural variability. Yeah, I just have one slide. I, I finally figure out how to go back to my slides. Uh, here. Oh, yeah. I think, okay, now this one, uh, I mean, it's not that good, but uh, you can see like we did different estimates of internal variability and this is the large ensembles. We chose it because it's the largest number, but you could also estimate it from the control runs and uh, for this, uh, and you can also estimate it between kind of the difference as the scenic five mean minus observational data set or so on. So, so we did many different ways and so we, in the end, we ended up, to, we chose like the, the kind of the largest trend. And uh, we would argue that they are like, uh, those estimates are consistent with the earlier studies. So for this particular period considered, I'm not particularly worried that like uh, our observations are just like, yeah, like way outside of the internal variability range we considered. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so one more question from Tianle, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name. Uh, what are the models that simulate the recent warming better saying about future warming in the Southern Ocean, which is talked about in Zelinka? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, yeah, we didn't really look into it, so I don't have an answer from uh, the top of my head. Also, I guess in this method, we just showed that the high warming models are less likely, but we, we can't really say more about other models, like, yeah. But uh, I think that's a really good thing to explore, yeah. And, oh, sorry, this just one more slide I had. So this a sensitivity analysis we did, and like here we use, at the bottom panel, we use the large ensembles of how many models were available at the time for different models. So you can see this kind of horizontal bars, and you kind of get almost the same constraint as, like, it's not that, like, you still end up getting some generally consistent results regardless of what kind of method you use, if you use bootstrapping or weighted regression. So I would say that's like enough a kind of confirmation that it works, yeah. Uh, well, in the interest of time, we should uh, move on. Well, thanks so much to... for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Okay, James, can you share your slide? Your slides? Hello, yes. I'll um, just try and share my screen. Why can't I share my screen? Um, well, there should be an option. I don't you seem to have an option to share my screen currently. I seem to. Hmm. 
Yeah. You go to the uh, bottom, there's a green. I do, yes. All right, I do. Sorry. Oh, can you do that, James? Yeah. I don't know what that is. <laughs> is that visible then? Yes, that yeah, is. Looks, looks good. Right. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Thanks, Andy, for the invitation. I have to say, if, um, if you have any complaints about going off the topic of climate science, you have to blame Andy because this was actually his um, suggestion. I think he must have realised I've not really been doing any climate science, anything interesting in climate science recently. Um, I gave him this title, A Modeler's View of COVID. But of course, as soon as doing it, I realised it really should have been a data assimilator's view of COVID. And this is really much, as much about the data as it is about the models. The data assimilation being very much my background. Um, and it's also rather from a, health, from a UK perspective, although I don't focus entirely on the UK. Um, so going back to the start of the story from our, from our point of view, um, in the middle of March, the government's position was to flatten the epidemic curve, but not yet. The aim was to sort of do a mitigated um, epidemic. You may have seen these um, flattening the curve um, graphics bouncing around the internet. The idea being that if we didn't do anything, we'd have a massive epidemic with a big peak that would exceed the capacity. Could you stop making the noise, Jude, please? Thank you. Um, you'd exceed the healthcare capacity. Uh, if you did have um, some mitigation, then you would stay under the, under the limits of the healthcare capacity. Um, and so in the middle of March, the 12th to the 16th, the experts, the scientists and the government ministers were saying we were four weeks behind Italy and the doubling time is five to six days. So the peak was a little way off yet. So we weren't supposed to do anything at that point. Um, however, this was something that a lot of people, a lot of members of the public found rather puzzling and worrying because at the time it was fairly obvious to everybody who'd looked at the numbers that we were actually about two weeks behind Italy and the doubling time of the epidemic was around three days. For instance, here's a tweet from Richard Vadden who produced this, this, this really good um, radio program, BBC More, More or Less on BBC Radio. Um, which concerns numbers and statistics in the news. And they've done a really good series of articles about the COVID epidemic and the numbers and statistics in it. So I really recommend listening to, um, you can get podcasts of, the, of, the, of, the, of those programs. David Spiegelhalter is a very famous professor in risk and uncertainty, especially in health. And here's a plot of the uh, daily number of deaths in Italy and the UK, both showing a doubling time of about two to three days. There's a 37% increase per day in deaths. 37% in one country, 35 in the other. And the distance between them, the horizontal distance is about uh, two weeks, uh, that's 15 days, to an equal position on the line. And here, a graph I drew of um, doubling times across three different European countries. We've got the cases in the triangles at the top, and then the smaller number of deaths and the, the crosses of the, with the different colors for different countries. This is just a linear regression through the points for each one of these data sets. And the background, the black lines here shown in the background of the plot, indicate a doubling time of three days. So you can see that basically these lines are all three-day doubling. Um, this one's a bit faster. One's just one is a little bit slower with a very short time, time series. This is just using data up to the 14th of March. So by the 14th of March, it was pretty obvious that we were two weeks behind Italy and the doubling time was three days. And yet the experts were telling us that it was much slower and less urgent than that. Um, so I looked into why they come out with these things and how they've managed to justify these statements. And it turns out that these official statements by the experts were based on state-of-the-art epidemiological models that they've run that had simply not been calibrated at all. They'd simply taken the model, stuck in some parameters and run it. So the main, um, the most famous simulation that was published on the 16th of March had a doubling time of 4.8 days. And how they'd chosen the parameters for this model is simply taking them from the literature, which was at that point was entirely based on the very early start of the outbreak in China, which is all actually got into the peer reviewed literature. And for example, the R0 parameter, which if you've, if you've been following the news about this, is this is the fundamental growth um, rate of the, of, of the epidemic. They use this number 2.4, which came from the literature even though they knew that parameters depend greatly on the location and the social structure and the environment. And they're not, they're not the physical parameters that are just known for the world. So uh, parameters for China aren't necessarily going to be relevant to, to Britain, but they still just use them. So this is the point at which I started to do some work really. Uh, Julia told me, well, you know, you do data assimilation, take a model and, and, and use this data and see what you come up with. 
So I found this very simple model called a SEER model, which is sort of the simplest possible epidemiological model you can use. Um, it's a sort of box model where uh, it describes that the it describes the, the the population which starts off as being susceptible to the disease, and they get exposed to the disease when they contact an infected person, and then after a latent period they become infectious themselves, and then after a further time they get removed, either get recovered, or perhaps dead. Um, the model I'm using has a homogeneous population where every every person is equal, or the population is just just considered to be a, a a homogeneous whole. The way this differs from a state-of-the-art model is that they will discretize the population into different types, either by age or by occupation or even down to the level of individuals. And the, an obvious analogy for climate scientists to think of here is that I'm using the equivalent of a simple two-layer energy balance model versus um, a state-of-the-art global climate model. Um, so I can do parameter estimation using the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, which um, quite by chance I'd actually been doing for a simple two-layer energy balance model in climate science just recently. So it really is very much the same sort of thing I've always been doing. And um, a description, this is described in this, in this, uh, in this um, manuscript, which is on MedArchive, which is sort of the, the medical version of archive, which you can look at if you want to see the full details of the model. So this result here is what I get when I'm calibrating it here to the cases, the number of, number of detected cases in the UK up to, the, up to March the 14th. Um, the data in the triangles and my model fits just given by this, um, this cone, this, this plume of results. And you can see I get an R0 parameter of 3.5, which is much higher than the Imperial College value. And the doubling time is just under three days, so 2.8, so a range of 2.3 to 3.7. What this means when you run it forward to do, to simulate the whole um, epidemic, well, this is a comparison here I've got as well as the blue fitted model, which I calibrated using data up to the March the 14th, I also put in the parameters that the Imperial College run used, and that's the red line. So on the left here, we've got the deaths per day on a log scale, and you can see that my blue curve really fits this validation data. So these, these purple crosses were data that were not available for, valid, for, for calibration of the model. They're independent validation. And you can see that the blue line fits it really perfectly. Um, the Imperial College model is basically rubbish and the log scale really flatters it here. If you think about the, the scale here, there's a factor of 10 here between 50 and 500. So by the end of the month, even two weeks after they'd issued their forecast in the middle of March, they were out by a factor of 10, which is quite, um, quite a serious error. I think. Looking on the right, you see curves for the number of cases. That's the number of ill people in the dotted lines and the number of dead people in the solid lines. And so this is why they were saying we shouldn't do anything for a while because they thought it was still a month or so off. But in fact, we were right at the point at which things were really kicking off at the day in which they issued, issued the forecast. So since then, I've been doing um, forecasts and analyses I've put out on Twitter every day. And uh, the original uh, approach I chose was to use a piecewise constant R value. So I'd have an R value up to the date of lockdown. This is the date at which basically everything shut down in the UK, the 23rd of March. And so I'd estimate a value of R before then and a value of R after then and do the um, simulation. So the green plume is the model's predicted deaths. These circles are the actual deaths recorded and the purple line is just the median. And so I did this for a while and it seemed to work fairly well. It gives a really quite a nice fit. One, uh, another bit of analysis that that's, uh, arose from this is, the, uh, is this uh, analysis of the lockdown date and, and the implications of what that means. And the main moral of the story is if you're gonna do a lockdown, you have to do it as soon as possible. This is what we did in the UK. If we'd locked down a week earlier, we'd have had roughly um, 30,000 fewer deaths because it's an exponential growth. This is the idea here is I just changed from R0 to RT at an earlier stage in the simulation and it cuts the, um, because it's an exponential growth in this, in this part, um, cutting it a week earlier means you get three quarters of a reduction in deaths. A week later, it would have been much worse. No lockdown would have been, would have been horrible. Um, and the USA, I did the same thing. So this paper actually, which has just been published this very afternoon, Yay. contains a lot of comparisons of different countries around the world, including the USA, and if you want to see the numbers, from these plots, this is the USA saying what it would have looked like. Well, this is what it did look like up to the time in which we wrote the paper. This is what it would have looked like if you'd, if you'd locked down a bit earlier, if you'd locked down a bit later, 
or if you're not locked down at all, but if you want the numbers, I think they're in the paper, which is doing an economic analysis of, of, of the implications of this. So um, after doing this for a while, we decided that the piecewise constant R parameter was a little bit limited because you could only have a few segments. And now that controls are being relaxed and changed on a piecemeal basis, it's not really appropriate to say that R is constant for a long period of time. And this Markov chain Monte Carlo method can only cope with having a few different values of R, a few different segments. So I'm now using a time series approach in which R is assumed to vary using this sort of Brownian motion type of idea where the R value on, this, on, on, on any day is the R value on the previous day plus some, some deviation, which is prime. My prior for this is just the Gaussian, little small Gaussian deviation. So it's just a random walk, really. I'm also, using, I'm also using cases as well as deaths, which means you need another, fact, another um, parameter, another free parameter, which means I've got about 400 parameter values to estimate, <laughs> which is quite a struggle for MCMC. Um, unfortunately, something I developed earlier, um, <laughs> a method for developing, uh, a method for doing parameter estimation in GCM is in climate models, which seems to be an extremely efficient way, iterative ensemble Kalman smoother, which seems to be a very efficient way of, um, of estimating parameters. Uh, so now, uh, the sort of thing I'm producing is this sort of analysis where we've got the cases on the top graph and the deaths on the bottom graph. Um, the R number is this pink plume on the bottom graph, which drops down at lockdown, and then it drops up because we opened the pubs in July the 4th. And you see the turning here and the number of cases starting to go up. So I reckon that R in the UK is about 1.1. The government still regards it, still claims it's below um, one. So we'll have to see who's right about that. A few, just this is, uh, I think, the last slide. Um, a few. Um, Illustrations of what we think might happen over the autumn as people start to go back to school in September either It might either jump up or it might ramp up. I might ramp up or jump up in September a bit And if it does we're going to get a second epidemic which might well be worse than the first we've had Boris Johnson said it will all be over by Christmas, but I'm not sure he meant it quite in this way <laughs> We'll be dead by Christmas <laughs> um, And this is the summary which I'll just leave up for you to look at I say don't be afraid to step out of your lane if you think you can make a contribution in a new field but don't expect any thanks for it. A well-calibrated simple model is better than an uncalibrated complex one. There are three different um, places you can read more about this work. This thing, the House of Lords uh, Science and Technology Committee um, evidence summarizes the, the, uh, the, 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 evidence, the, the um, analysis of the um, calibration of the model and whether or not um, the government scientists did a good job of it. And I think I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, before we take questions, I should just say why uh, uh, I invited James. I, I think this, th there are two things that I think are interesting about COVID, besides obviously that it's impacting all of our lives and we wouldn't be having this remote seminar series without it, um, is that a lot of the techniques of, est of, of parameter estimation, um, you know, it goes through all of science, but a lot of climate science is parameter estimation. So I think, um, examples of how people do it really badly are very interesting. I think that the sense I get from epidemiology is that they were completely unprepared for the kind of policy politicized environment that climate science has been dealing with for 20 years. So, you know, I looked at this stuff and it was completely predictable that they were going to get run over by a bus, a lot of these people. And indeed, um, it was good to see uh, James and other people with climate expertise come in and um, sort of know how to deal with the situation um, uh, more more gracefully than a lot of the people that didn't realize what happens when you get into a really political uh, environment. Um, so, um, Christy, uh, we can do questions. Yeah. Um. As soon as there are any, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask one, which uh, comes back to climate uh, science and sort of the parallels between uh, this kind of modeling and um, climate science. So if you're interested in making a multi-decadal climate for sort of a near to medium term climate forecast, um, what's better to use a GCM or to use a two layer EBM that's calibrated to the historical observations? Well, I think 
I think we can use GCMs that are calibrated to observations in the sort of way that, that Cassio just talked about, actually. Um, I guess that's a good point. I mean, there is a, there's, so this simple model, a very simple model cannot possibly investigate the detailed uh, response to tweaks, to minor tweaks in policy. Like there's no way that this sort of model I'm playing with could tell you what would happen if you opened schools or not. Um, whereas the more complicated models, they can really work in a more diagnostic sense. So there's definitely a, a, the more, you know, you need the more complicated models as well, but they just need to be used to it better. So, Jake, um, you have a comment. So, the SEER model is just basically like a four box model, right? You have, you have populations in each one. And then, are you assuming that once they get to the R box, they can't go back to, they can't recycle back to the front? In, in this particular version, yes. There are, if you look at the Wikipedia page, you'll see there are loads of different, subtly different varieties where people assume different things about losing immunity and things like that. But just in this simple, bo simple model, yeah, the assumption is they'll stay immune for long enough. I mean, they only have to stay immune for long enough for the simulation. If, if you're doing a short simulation, it doesn't matter. But yeah, these more, uh, these more long-term issues are, um, you know, they're not something you could ever address within the model. You'd have to put them in. You, you, could, you could make the model as complicated as you want. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting is, is these models do look like these uh, climate, you know, two-layer models of the climate system. And then they also have what looked to me like Lagrangian trajectory models where they track individual people. They have lots of these individual, what are they called, actor something models. Um, uh, so, so there agent based are, modeling, yeah, I think. Agent based models, that's right. And so there are these real parallels between the frameworks of the models in these various fields that I thought was really, really interesting. Modeling, yeah. Looks like we have a question. Um, yeah. From uh, if you want to read it. Yeah, we got two questions. We got one from Eric uh, the Weaver who asks: Has your work had any influence on the COVID response in the UK? Uh, no, I would say not. I think it may be more that it, would, it may be more likely to have influence on the uh, on the inquiries that are going to follow as to as, as, as to how it was dealt with. Because to be honest, by the time I worked out what going on. Um, the modelers had actually had more or less got there. It's just they didn't get there until sort of the end of them, until it was too late. Uh, and Daniel Cole asks, is there an understanding in epidemiology that a hierarchy of models can be useful or is it currently a modeling free for all? I would say it seems to be, it seems to be quite two, two quite distinct um, Subfield, because yeah, the simple models, the simple models, I mean, they do calibrate them in a lot of, you know, they, they do the sort of thing I've been doing. There's whole bunches of people do that. And the same people also run the really complicated models, but they don't seem to do this cross fertilization between them, which is um, one of the limitations. Too. Although to be honest, the, even, the com even the state of the art models, they could have been calibrated directly. They're not as expensive as GCMs. They take sort of minutes to hours to run. And when you've literally got one important parameter, you know, you can, you really can calibrate it. You could have, they could have done a much better job of calibrating even the state of the art model. It's much harder for GCMs, I would say. So I think maybe we should go to the general discussion. So if um, anybody, so we're basically done. Uh, if people need to go to other meetings, uh, they are welcome to do that. But if people have sort of general questions for any of the speakers or, um, you know, if, if you're the kind of person, uh, more of a comment than a question, sometimes I do that. Um, this is the time to do that. So again, you can raise your hand, we can unmute you, or you can type a, a comment or question into the chat box. I can launch a question. I guess this will be primarily for Kashia, but anyone else that might have an insight into this. Uh, it was my understanding that there was a bit of a divergence in emergent constraints for CMIP5 between these, uh, the constraints on overall warming, which seemed to suggest a lower climate sensitivity and more process-based constraint that seemed to suggest a higher climate sensitivity. Um, 
do we know if this, has anybody looked at these in CMIP six, and do we know if the same um, overall pattern holds? And if so, what might explain that? Like, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to comment. Uh, so so um, I think, yeah, like the reason why our discrete margin constraint works so well for CMIC 6 is because there are so many high ECS models. So when you have this correlation, it really kind of uh, determines, like, in a way, the, the slope of your line. And also now with new models coming in, luckily all the high ECS models release their data earlier on. So kind of like now we're just like adding more models in the middle. So it doesn't really change much. The correlation, but I suppose, uh, yeah, I don't know if the, the, the process based question. I'm not really a process based person, so I would have to think about your question. Or maybe here's, an, here's another framing of the question. Um, if we think that some, it was my understanding, and I'm probably not the expert in this either, but the, it was my understanding some of these models are supposed to do certain processes you know better like mixed phase clouds so it suggests that then we may have fixed one process um, and uncovered something else that now makes these models um, run too hot or it's possible that in cmip 5 there were compensating errors and now in cmip 6 we fixed some processes and um, Others so, are so still wrong. So yeah, I guess yeah, what, are, what, what are the yeah. issues with these high sensitivity models? What are the processes that make them run hot? Do we know? Uh, so I think it, it probably might be model dependent, right? Like the cloud feedback is the important uh, parameter de determining high ECS. But um, what's an interesting exercise that many modeling centers are doing now is running, for example, the CMIC uh, 5 version of the four things with the CMIC 6 model, or also tuning the CMIC 6 model to replicate the same ECS value it had for CMIC 5. So I think those type of exercises will help in better understanding. So one, actually, there's one high ECS model, the CNRM, the French model, which is right on spawn, like right in the middle of our observational constraints. So it's not in this cloud of high ECS models, but it was like right in the middle of our rectangles. And I talked to the CNRM people, and why do they think it's the case? And uh, it had to do with the, um, sorry, the something like with the, like I'm also not an atmospheric person, I'm sorry, like something to do like with the, uh, like, uh, yeah, parameterization of the atmosphere, that they were able to replicate the observed warming very well. And even though it was a high ECS model with ECS above four and a half degrees, it was still showing just the correct warming rate for, the, for that period considered. So it definitely has to do like with the processes, but I think it's a combination of different effects and those exercises, like trying to run the CMIC six high ECS models, uh, you know, that ends up having sensitivity the same as the CMIC five version of it would really help probably with better understanding. Uh, anyone else can comment. I, I'm, I'm a carbon budget person. I could talk to you about carbon budget. <laughs> um. <laughs> Eric has a great question. Has there been any talk on what to do differently in CMIP 7 based on the CMIP 6 experience? Um, I don't know if there anyone from modeling centers maybe can provide a better answer. I think the problem they have with CMIP 7 is that already like some of the like early planning already was in progress because it's such a long process, right? So it's really uh, like some of the things they were thinking on already are like in progress. But I definitely, yeah, I don't know. I think it's uh, it's an interesting thing, like especially the IPCC report that has to deal now with dealing all those different models, which are maybe not necessarily likely. And like, how do you kind of frame it, right? Any other questions for any of our speakers? Okay, well, if not, um, it's already past one. So uh, let's thank our speakers for some great talks. I'm gonna clap because other people can't. Yeah, I'll just say one thing um, and, again oh. before everybody, before everyone goes, if you're interested in giving a talk, um, email me and Christy. 
And yeah, we're still we're still looking for volunteers for our next talk. So yeah, I mean, I figure we'll keep doing it. as long as people keep showing up. We'll keep doing this. Um, you know, very low overhead. So uh, so I guess uh, thanks everybody, and um, we will see you um, in about a month, give or take. Oh, and the the CF MIP. The CFMIP uh, registration is uh, online. So if you want more climate sensitivity and cloud feedbacks, be sure to uh, register for the CFMIP meeting. Okay, I think that's all I had. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs>